Warning, the following episode contains descriptions of violence, murder, adult language, and sexual assault. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello guys, welcome back to the CMP podcast. This is Christina Floyd, Floyd. Can't even say my own fucking last name right. Um, Christina Ford, your host as always. How are you guys doing today? Um, this is like the last nice weekend I feel like that we're gonna have for a while. It's so like it's such like a perfect fall day. Like I would love to go like apple picking or something, but apple picking also means there's a lot of fucking people there, a lot of coronavirus. I'm all set on that super disappointing because I love I really would like to go to like a haunted attraction of some sort but there's so many people there and just with my autoimmune disease I don't want to get it you know because there's thing is with like my autoimmune disease it's there's a chance I could get it and it could be really really bad or there's a chance that I could get it and be perfectly fine but you still you don't want to take that risk you know and I have a higher risk of it being bad versus other people my age so that's just it sucks but I mean it's all right you know I miss going out I miss certain people and stuff you know but it's how it is it's 2020 this year is uh shitty that's for sure Um, And also, before we get started, I would like to remind everyone that they should fill out either their absentee ballots or go vote on November 3rd. The only way we're going to change anything in this country is if we vote. So please, 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 please vote. Um, I just dropped off my absentee ballot a couple days ago, and it's super important that you vote. I think, especially if you're a woman, we just got the right to vote in the last hundred years, and we need to take advantage of that um so yeah so go vote no matter what go 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 vote okay um so today you guys obviously at this point know what we're going to talk about but we're going to be discussing Richard Ramirez also known as the Night Stalker I really want to do him because he's a I want to do a serial killer this week because we haven't done one of those um we've done family annihilators we've done just attempted murders we've done massacre but I wanted to do a serial killer because I feel like when everyone thinks of true crime and being interested in true crime you automatically think a serial killer and Richard Ramirez this case is the one that like really spiked my interest into like why like I feel like Richard Ramirez was just like pure evil starting from when he first started committing crimes and even to his execution like the stuff he would say it was just I don't think he was like like I don't know what your beliefs are but he was very into saying that he was like the devil on earth and the shit that he would do and say like it's not far off because he did some pretty terrible shit um and it all took place in like the greater Los Angeles area just to give you guys like an idea of where it was and also the way that he was caught fucking badass like yes that's the type of shit you see in a movie you know but I'm not gonna get into too much because we're gonna discuss it obviously but before we get started um don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, whatever you do. The more it happens, the more people are going to hear about the podcast. And I appreciate your love and your support so much. You have no idea. Um, this podcast is my passion. It's my dream. So you just even sending an episode to a friend means the absolute world to me. We will be having a sort of Halloween special coming up soon, and that will be announced within the next week. I mean, you'll be hearing this on Monday, so within the next week, just keep an eye out on our Instagram. Just because I wanted to thank you guys, um, the feedback and 
what's been happening with the podcast is any is everything beyond my wildest dreams. Um, I wanted this podcast to take off, but I did not realize how fast it would take off. And it's just, it means the world to me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to get started. So Richard Ramirez was born. Oh, before I get started, I got my information from Wikipedia Britannica. I think that's how you say it. I'm probably wrong. And a biography.com. So just so you guys know, as far as like where I got all of my information, um, so let's get started. Richard Ramirez was born in El Paso, Texas on February 29th, 1960, the youngest of Julian and Mercedes Ramirez's, Ramirez's five children. His father, Julian, a Mexican national and former Juarez, Mexico policeman, who later became a laborer on the Santa Fe Railroad, was prone to fits of anger that often resulted in physical abuse. As a 12-year-old, Richard, or Richie, as he was known to his family, was strongly influenced by his older cousin, Miguel Mike Ramirez, a decorated U.S. Army Green Beret combat vet who often boasted of his gruesome exploits during the Vietnam War. And that alone, the Vietnam War was, don't get me wrong, there was a lot of soldiers from the U.S. that they were going to fight like they were doing what they had to do for their country but there was also a lot of atrocities that happened um just like the my Lai massacre there was a lot of raping by u.s soldiers killing for no reason of civilians um so that's why there was a lot of like backlash about it. but just to put in perspective like the kind of shit that went on during the Vietnam War. Not even just saying that, like, pe- like the soldiers that also did them, but there's just, there was a lot of PTSD from those things and stuff, and it's just a very, it was a very sensitive war in a way, like, it was one that n- usually in America, there's not a lot of backlash when America went to war, but that was one that, I mean, as everyone knows, that there was a lot of protests, like, a lot of people did not support them going to war and doing the things that they were doing. So it wasn't a good time. Um, he shared Polaroid photos of his victims, including Vietnamese woman he had raped. In some of the photos, Mike posed with the severed head of a woman he had abused. Ramirez, who had begun smoking marijuana at the age of 10, bonded with Mike over joints and gory war stories. Um, and my thing is... My personal opinion is I've read a lot of crime stories and people are always like, oh, they started smoking marijuana at this age and that's why the way they are. Don't get me wrong. You should not be smoking anything. You should not be doing drugs at fucking 10 years old. Don't get me wrong. But, but there is, you can't blame it all on that because there are, and I know people that I've gone to school with that started at that age and they're not fucking serial killers you know, so don't get me wrong, drugs do affect your brain and the chemical makeup of your brain and the way it works, but you, people sometimes use that and be like, well, he did that, so that's why he became the way he was. No, there was a lot of different things that made him the way he is, and you can't pinpoint just one thing. Does that make any sense? Like, I don't support doing drugs or drinking at that age, like, at least wait till you're 18. I wish I waited till I was 18, like even just partying in general, but you, like, you can't just blame it on that one thing, you know? Like he was hanging out with his cousin who showed Polaroid pictures of the woman he raped and beheaded, but you don't know marijuana is like, what? No, he was surrounded by death and negativity. Like that's all he knows. So he thinks it's okay. You know? That's all I'm going to say. Um, Mike taught his young cousin some of his military skills, such as killing with stealth. Around this time, Ramirez began to seek escape from his father's violent temper by sleeping in a local cemetery. Ramirez was present on May 4th, 1973, when his cousin Mike fatally shot his wife Jessie in the face with a 38 caliber revolver during a domestic argument. Um, after the shooting, Ramirez became withdrawn from his family and peers. Later that year, 
He moved in with his older sister, Ruth, and her husband, Roberto, an obsessive peeping Tom who Richie, who took Richie along on his nocturnal exploits. So he's just surrounded by not good role models, like from literally the minute he was born, because like they said, like his dad was physically abusive and then his cousin is showing him all of this and he ends up being present for his cousin murdering his wife. And then now he moves out of his parents' house to try and get away from everything and his sister's husband is committing crimes. Granted, peeping Tom compared to murdering your wife, like obviously one's a lot worse than the other, but they're still crimes. They're still things that you should not be doing that a child should not be seeing. You know, like they're, you can't show them these things and then wonder why they became the way, like, I feel like, I do think with Richard Ramirez, he was, he was a product of his environment and from the way he was born, because it's not like, at least from what you read, like he came from good people, you know? Um, Ramirez also began using LSD and cultivated an interest in Satanism, Mike was found not guilty of Jesse's murder by reason of insanity and was released in 1977 after four years of incarceration at the Texas State Mental Hospital. And once he got out, he just started hanging out with Richard again. So, like, it wasn't, like, just because he went in, like, now Richard's not seeing him anymore. Once he, and I read on other places as well that while he was in the mental hospital, they wrote each other letters, they would talk... Um, so he was still influencing him even when he was in there. And then also now he's living with his sister and her husband, who her husband isn't the greatest gem either. So he's just surrounded by terrible things. Um, Ramirez began to meld his sexual fantasies with violence, including forced bondage and rape. While still in school, he took a job at a local Holiday Inn where he used his pass key to rob sleeping patrons. His employment ended abruptly after a hotel guest returned to his room to find Ramirez attempting to rape his wife. Although the husband beat Ramirez senseless at the scene, criminal charges were dropped when the couple, who lived out of state, declined to return to testify against him. Um, Ramirez dropped out of Jefferson High School in the ninth grade, and at the age of 22, he moved to California where he settled permanently. So, you know, oh, I don't know if I had said before, but he was, oh, no, yeah, yeah. So he had lived in Texas, and so that's when he moved to California once he um, dropped out and everything and went through all this. So, I don't know. I mean, I completely understand why the couple didn't want to testify against him. One, they're out of state. That's, I mean, we don't know which state they lived in, but they must live far enough where it'd be a severe inconvenience to come and testify against him and trials last for a while they're not like one day that they have to come for and then they can leave you know and also we don't know how she was feeling like she almost was raped by someone who worked at the hotel they were staying at like you can only imagine the damage that does to someone's psyche and not wanting to face the person you know and if you look up the the pictures of Ramirez it's not like like Ted Bundy type person where it's like, ooh, you didn't see it coming. Richard Ramirez, he looks scary. Like he just he looks like you're like you think of a serial killer boogeyman and Richard Ramirez. Like he looks scary. Especially the pictures that I saw of like after he was in prison and stuff. Like he had like filed his teeth and sh- like scary scary so you know I wouldn't want to fucking face him either I'd be like hell the fuck no I'm coming back I'm getting the hell out of Dodge and you're never gonna see me again because I want to stay as far away as I can from that man nope all right so we're on to the murders on April 10th 1984 Ramirez murdered nine-year-old May Lung in the basement of the hotel where he was living in the Tenderloin district of San Francisco. He raped and beat the girl before stabbing her to death and hanged her body from a pipe. This Ramirez's 
first known killing was not initially identified as being connected to the subsequent crime spree. In 2009, his DNA was matched to a sample obtained at the crime scene. In 2016, officials disclosed evidence of a second suspect identified through a DNA sample retrieved from the scene who is believed to have been present at her murder. Authorities have not publicly identified the suspect, described as being a juvenile at the time, and have not brought charges due to the lack of evidence. I don't understand that. If you find a DNA sample that they're like, yep, like they, they're they confident enough to announce to people that they're like, this person was at the murder, why the hell wouldn't you bring them in publicly? At, like... I'm, I just, that's what I want to know. I would love to talk to, because at the same time, like, we can get angry about it, but we also don't know what, like, we don't know what we don't know, you know? Like, there could be something very, there, a big hole in the story, which is why they haven't announced him. Like, maybe they don't want him to run. Maybe they don't want the person to know that they know yet until they get more of him. We don't know, but I want to know why. You know, like, why haven't you brought him in or have you brought him in and he has an alibi or what's the like, I I just thought DNA was like, once you have someone's DNA at a scene, it's like cut and dry. It's like, okay, you were there, like clearly. So why? So what else do you need? That's that's my question, you know. So that was hit. That was a murder. And. On April 10th, 1984. But obviously, like I said, it's not connected to the crime spree. Um, That's all I really found on her murder, which is super sad because she, like, it's just, she didn't deserve that, you know? And, like, she also doesn't deserve to be forgotten about. She was nine, and this poor girl went through the absolute worst. Like, she was scared for her life up until the moment that she died. Excuse me. But... You know, oh, breaks my heart. So now we're on to the actual quote unquote night stalker crimes, which is what he got his name from. So on June 28th, 1984, 79 year old Jenny Vincow was found brutally murdered in her apartment in Glaswell Park, Los Angeles. She had been stabbed repeatedly while asleep in her bed and her throat slashed so deeply that she was nearly decapitated. Ramirez's fingerprint was found on a mesh screen he removed to gain access through an open window. So that's where they found evidence of him being there on that one. Moving on. Oh, and then also, so this ha- so the first murder of May Long happened in April. So his actual crime, like the Night Stalker crimes, didn't start until eight months later. You know, like, he waited. So that's why they're not connecting them. Like, saying, like, oh, okay, like, this was a part of the Night Stalker crimes. They are just saying that it's, like, a separate crime, you know? Um, On March 17th, 1985, Ramirez attacked 22-year-old Maria Hernandez outside her home in Rosemead, California, shooting her in the face with a 22 caliber handgun after she pulled into her garage. She survived when the bullet ricocheted off the keys she held in her hands as she lifted them to protect herself. Inside the house was her roommate, Dale Yoshi Okazaki, 34, who heard the gunshot and ducked behind a counter when she saw Ramirez enter the kitchen. When she raised her head, he shot her once in the forehead, killing her. What that's... It's just... That's just so sad. Like, she was hiding, and she thought he was gone, and so that's why she lifted her head, and then he saw her. That's so... Like, it's, like, like reading a sentence like that, it, like, strikes fear in your soul, you know? Like, I can only imagine how terrifying that is. Like, you think you're in the clear, like, she thinks everything's fine, and then it's not, you know? And then her roommate survived because she just happened just the way she was holding the key. That, like, everyone knows how small a fucking key is. Like, that, it was literally perfectly placed, perfectly placed in her hand, and that's why she didn't die. Like, that's just like a, I feel like that's like a one in a million chance, you know? Um, within an hour of the Rosemead home invasion, Ramirez pulled 30-year-old, uh, Tessai Leanne Veronica Yu 
out of her car in Monterey Park, California. Let me just say I'm so sorry if I pronounce these names wrong. I'm really trying. Full respect here. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, shot her twice with a 22 caliber handgun and fled. She was pronounced dead upon arrival at the hospital. The two murders, an attempted third in a single day, attracted extensive coverage from news media who dubbed the curly-haired attacker with bulging eyes and a wide-spaced rotting teeth, the walk-in killer, and the valley intruder. So he had other names before, but... See, like, even that one... Like, do you, you hear, like, how scary this guy looked... Like, he was terrifying. So people were so scared. And, and like, this is the 80s, and I feel like it's very, it was very common to just leave your doors unlocked. You know? Like, they'll just leave their front door unlocked, and then this would happen. Because this isn't the only serial killer between... You saw a very sharp increase in serial killers between the fucking 60s and the 80s. That 30-year period, it was a goddamn free-for-all, I swear. And I f- do think it's because people would leave their doors unlocked. So it was, and so people would, like, bad people would know it's super easy to get inside because no one locked their fucking doors. Lock your doors, people. Lock them. All the time. No matter what. Your car, your fucking house, your shed, whatever. And lock your windows. Everything. Oh gives me anxiety when I see people just leave their door unlocked. I'm like, why are you doing that? Lock it. Now. Right now. So, on March 27th, 1985, Ramirez entered a home that he had burglarized a year earlier in Whittier, California at about 2 a.m. and killed the sleeping Vincent Charles Zazara, age 64, with a gunshot to his head from a 22 caliber handgun. Zazara's wife, Maxine Lavinia, I think that's how you say it, It's a beautiful middle name, if it is. Um, Zazara, aged 44, was awakened by the gunshot, and Ramirez beat her and bound her hands while demanding to know where her valuables were. While he ransacked the room, Maxine escaped her bonds and retrieved a shotgun from under the bed, which was not loaded. The infuriated Ramirez shot her three times with the twenty-two, then fetched a large carving knife from the kitchen. He mutilated her body by stabbing her several times, then gouged out her eyes and placed them in a jewelry box, which he left with. The autopsy determined that the mutilations were post-mortem. Ramirez left footprints from a pair of Avia sneakers in the flower beds, which the police photographed and cast. This was virtually the only evidence that the police had at the time. Bullets found at the scene were matched to those found at previous attacks, and the police realized the serial killer was at large. Vincent and Maxine's bodies were discovered by their son, Peter. That's, like, she was literally fighting for her life. And what she thought was loaded, and she was basically, like, she was going to live, it wasn't. And he saw her do that. Um, There's a couple documentaries where it kind of describes, like, exactly what happened and how she kind of... Because from the documentaries that I found, she was, like, on the bed and he was in the other room looking for stuff and she, like, rolled off the bed. Like, he wasn't really in the room, but then there's other documentaries that say that he was in the room. So, I've heard conflicting stories, um... I don't know exactly which one it was, but she was literally fighting for her life, and then he killed her and took her eyes, which is crazy to me. I've seen a couple Criminal Minds, Law and Order and shit, where people, like, the killers in the show take their eyes, which I feel like that, like, gouging someone's eyes out, like, that takes some, like, like, that's, like, sick. I th- like what? Oh, gives me the chills. Um, on May fourteenth, nineteen eighty-five, Ramirez returned to Monterey Park and entered the home of Bill Doy, sixty-six, and his disabled wife Lillian, fifty-six. Surprising Doy in his bedroom, Ramirez shot him in the face with a twenty-two semi-automatic pistol as Doy went for his own handgun. After beating the mortally wounded man into unconsciousness, Ramirez entered Lillian's bedroom, bound her with thumb cuffs which um 
thumb cuffs are a metal restraining device that lock the thumbs in proximity to each other. I had never heard of that before until this case. I didn't even know that was a thing. I thought there was just handcuffs and that was it. But I guess you can like hook someone's thumbs together instead of their hands, which is weird. I don't know why they would do that. Um, then raped her after he had ransacked the home for valuables. Bill Doy died of his injuries while in the hospital. Um, so yeah, from my understanding, his wife did live. And she was also part of the reason why they were able to catch him. And really, not even catch him right away. But just like figure out who it was that was doing this. Because she lived. Um, but... I just, this is why you need to, I believe you should have some sort of weapon on you, whether it's a, like, at home, whether it's a knife, whether it's a gun, like, just something to protect yourself by your bed, because that, like, I think my biggest fear is, like, a home invasion, like, on, like, real shit, a home invasion while I'm sleeping, my biggest fear, because, like, I feel like you're, you're most vulnerable when you're unconscious and you're sleeping and then someone breaks into your house and tries to kill you. Like, ah, ah. like at least if I'm awake and like it's during the day, I can like kind of see you coming. But if I'm sleeping, I don't see you coming. Obviously, because I'm fucking sleeping. Oh, that, that's big fear of mine. Um, on the night of May 29th, 1985, Ramirez drove a stolen car to Monrovia, California and stopped at the house of Mabel... Bell, um, 83, and her disabled sister, Florence Lang, 81. Finding a hammer in the kitchen, he bludgeoned, bludgeoned and bound Lang in her bedroom, then bound and bludgeoned Bell before using an electro electrical cord to shock the woman. After raping Lang, he used Bell's lipstick to draw a pentagram on her thigh as well as on the walls of both bedrooms. The women were found two days later alive but comatose and Bell later died of her injuries. So Lang lived. She's She was 81 and Mabel did not. Um, from what I also read with, the, with him drawing the pentagram on her thigh, um, they originally thought it was like a sacrifice type thing is what they were trying to do. Like, um, not really like he was just killing them to kill them because a serial killer is someone who kills three or more people in different, at different times. And then that's why they're considered a serial killer. So they thought that at first that that was connected to something else because it was the first time in these attacks that he had actually like drew something um and like we're gonna go into detail into other serial killers like son of sam um the happy face killer of like these killers that they would leave something or draw something and up until this point they had not seen that like they had just like evidence like his shoe print in the garden like they had stuff like that they didn't have anything that he left behind you know um the next day, Ramirez drove the same car to Burbank, California, and, sne and snuck into the home of Carol Kyle, 42. At gunpoint, he bound Kyle and her 11-year-old son with handcuffs and then ransacked the home. He released Kyle to direct him to where the family's valuables were. He then raped her repeatedly, and he repeatedly ordered her to not look at him, telling her at one point that he would cut her eyes out. And obviously, at this point, you don't know, but he has done that before. So, yeah serious threat um he fled the scene after retrieving the child from the closet and binding the two together again with the handcuffs so he let them live he was really just in there for to sexually assault her and take her shit which like i feel like that's even that's just even worse because now she's left with that like emotional scar you know and her son is because her son like just even if he didn't see her like, he's hearing everything. He's experiencing it, too. Like, you've now, like, you don't know what they, you've done now for the rest of their lives. Like, you could have permanently scarred their mental well-being, you know? Like, if anything like this happened to me, I would just never leave my house. I'd be like, well, like, that's why I fully, like, you hear some victims talk about it. Like, 
they just didn't want to leave their house anymore, like, because they were scared of leaving, and I don't blame them, like, after you see, in a way, like, the worst of humanity has to offer, it's like, how do I know that the next person on the street corner isn't just like him? So why am I going to leave my house? I'd make my house into a fucking fortress and you'd never see me again. Get some groceries delivered, especially with COVID now. It's normal to get your groceries delivered. Never see me leave. Nope. Stay inside. (laughs) On the night of July 2nd, 1985, he drove a stolen car to Arcadia, California and randomly selected the house of Mary Louise Cannon 75. See, these cases are the ones that really like stick with me more because it's very like when it comes to Richard Ramirez it was very random like there was no reason to the people that he picked like there's some serial killers like Ted Bundy they would and the son of Sam like they knew it was because of the hair so then people were changing their hair because they didn't want to get attacked but like there was a specific like victim mo that they had that at least in that way they could kind of pinpoint but like with this it's so randomized and and it's the same with like mass shootings like there's no specific kind of victim that they're looking for and I feel like that's even worse like I mean it's worse no matter what but it's like it these are the ones that's like what like there's no reason to it at least with the victim mo ones like the ones who are very specific it's like okay so He was targeting these people because of this. But with it, with Richard Ramirez, it's, he was just targeting them literally just because. So those are the ones I'm like, what? Like, I I don't understand it. I really don't. And I try. I I read over them over and over and over again. And I don't understand. And I wish I did. It's like a big question. Oh. After quietly entering the widowed grandmother's home, he found her asleep in her bedroom. He bludgeoned her, bludgeoned her into unconsciousness with a lamp and then repeatedly stabbed her using a 10-inch butcher knife from her kitchen. She was found dead at the scene. So, like, he he's just breaking into people's houses just to kill him. Just to kill them. It's, it's not like he's breaking in to steal something, he gets caught, and he kills them. No, he's just breaking in to kill them. That's his goal. On July 5th, 1985, Ramirez broke into a home in Sierra Madre, California, and bludgeoned 16-year-old Whitney Bennett with a tire iron as she slept in her bedroom. After searching in vain for a knife in the kitchen, Ramirez attempted to strangle the girl with a telephone cord. He was startled to see electrical sparks um, emanate from the cord, and when his victim began to breathe, he fled the house believing that Jesus Christ had intervened and saved her. Bennett survived the savage beating, although 478 stitches were required to close the lacerations to her scalp, which is like 478 stitches. Do you know, like, the damage that has to be done? And this, she's 16, but I also want to, like, Did her family hear anything? Like, how did, like, did they find her in the morning? That's what I couldn't find. Like, did they find her in the morning? Like, how did they find her? Did someone hear him? Anything? Or no? Like, I mean, like, obviously when you're asleep, like, if you're a deep sleeper, it's hard to wake up. Like, I could fucking sleep through a bomb, I swear to God. Like, I'm the deepest sleeper. But, like, that's just... And so then it's like, if no one found her until the morning, like, she's laying in her bed with these huge gashes in her fucking head because of, like, because no one woke up. And it's like, thank God she didn't die because 478 stitches, you know how much blood she must have had to have been losing? Oh, it's like stuff like, like, I could never imagine seeing that. And then the fact that someone's doing that to someone for no reason, it just blows my mind. I I don't, you know? But thank God that that fucking... I'm just glad that the cord... Because he... Their electrical sparks coming. Good thing it didn't fucking either set the house on fire or electrocute her to death. Like, what? What? I mean, at least it got him to leave. Because I definitely think if that didn't happen... Like, obviously he would have killed her. That's what he was trying to do. So it saved her life. Thank God. Um, On July 7th, 1985, 
Ramirez burglarized the home of Joyce Lucille Nelson, 61, in Monterey Park. Finding her asleep on her living room couch, he beat her to death using his fists and kicking her in the head. A shoe print from an Avia sneaker was left imprinted on her face. Jesus! Do you know how hard you have to kick someone to leave an imprint? After cruising two other neighborhoods, he returned to Monterey Park and chose the home of Sophie... I almost said Sophia. Sophie Dickman, 63. Ramirez assaulted and handcuffed Dickman at gunpoint, attempted to rape her and stole her jewelry. When she swore to him that he had taken everything of value, he told her to swear on Satan. Um, on July 20th, 1985, Ramirez purchased a machete before driving a stolen Toyota to Glendale, California. He chose the home of Leela Kneading, 66, and her husband, Maxon, 68. He burst into the sleeping couple's bedroom and hacked them with the machete, then killed them with shots to the head from a 22 caliber handgun. He further mutilated their bodies with the machete before robbing the house of valuables. After quickly fencing the stolen items from the needing residents, Ramirez drove to Sun Valley. So it's just like, it's just brutal, brutal, brutal. And he's just like, it's a killing spree. Like he's literally like, I feel like these are the type of cases that they're even more terrifying for the police, like, like detectives trying to rush to solve them because they're so random and it's like, you can't stop them. Like he's literally on a killing spree he's in a fucking manic episode like it's like when's the next one gonna be like fucking staying up all night holding a knife in your hand because you don't know who it's gonna be next what what's gonna happen next when he's gonna be caught because they just can't find this guy like they don't know who he is and that's so frustrating I can only imagine because I like I'm reading this and I'm getting frustrated that they haven't caught him yet so I can only imagine how they felt um at approximately 4 15 a.m he broke into the home of the Kovanath family he shot the sleeping Chiana Rong Kovanath in the head with a 25 caliber handgun and killed him instantly then repeatedly raped and beat Samkid Kovanath he bound the couple's terrified eight-year-old son before dragging some kid around the house to reveal the location of any valuable items which he stole during his assault he demanded that she swear to satan that she was not hiding any money from him so now it's now it's like he he's stealing everything from it i mean um from what i found at this point he was homeless so that's why it was that's why they say it was so easy for him to like get around under the radar because he had no homes, he had no bills, he, up until this point, he didn't have much, like, a criminal record, so it was very hard to figure out who he was and what he was doing and where he was going, um, and he was trying to do what he could so he could get money, feed himself, and then get to the next victim, you know, he's very, like, a nomadic lifestyle, on August 6, 1985, Ramirez drove to North Ridge, California, and broke into the home of Chris and Virginia Peterson. He crept into the bedroom, startled Virginia, 27, and shot her in the face with a 25 caliber semi-automatic handgun. My question is, where is he getting these guns? Because they don't really go explain that. Like, did he buy them off someone? Did he steal them? I That's just why I feel like he has so many. Like, every fucking killing i feel like we're hearing about another gun i don't know um where was i oh he then shot chris in the neck and attempted to flee chris fought back while avoiding being hit by two more shots during the struggle before ramirez managed to escape and the couple survived their injuries which is fucking crazy that they survived that girl got shot in the face what and she lived to tell the tale holy shit on August 8, 1985, Ramirez drove a stolen car to Diamond Bar, California, and chose the home of Sakina Abawath, 27, and her husband, Elias Abawath, 31. Sometime after 2.30 in the morning, he entered the house and went into the master bedroom. He instantly killed the sleeping Eloa with a shot to the head from a 25 caliber handgun. He handcuffed and beat Sakina while forcing her to reveal the locations of the family's jewelry and then brutally raped her. 
He repeatedly, he repeatedly demanded that she swear on Satan and she would not scream during his assault. So we're seeing that he's making everyone swear on Satan. Like, so that's a clue that the police obviously were very interested in. Um, I mean, as we read before, even before all this happened, he was a Satanist and he wasn't into Catholicism or anything. Um, there had, I did read that there had been a rumor going around that he, they thought that he was, um, picking these people also because they had some sort of, um, religious memorabilia or whatever in the window or somewhere, or he had seen it somewhere and that's why he was doing this. Um, it was, I never saw anything confirmed by the police, but that's just what I saw going around. Um... Yeah, so he demanded that she swear on Satan and that he would not that she would not scream during his assault. When the couple's three-year-old son entered the bedroom, Ramirez tied the child up and then continued to rape Sakina. After Ramirez left the home, Sakina untied her son and sent him to the neighbors for help. Uh, Ramirez, who had been following the media coverage of his crimes, left Los Angeles and headed to the San Francisco Bay Area. On August 18, 1985, he entered the home of Peter and Barbara Pan. He shot the sleeping Peter, 66, in the temple with a 25 caliber handgun. He then beat and sexually assaulted Barbara, 62, before shooting her in the head and leaving her for dead. At the crime scene, Ramirez used lipstick to scrawl a pentagram and the phrase Jack the Knife on the bedroom wall. When it was discovered that the ballistics and the shoe print evidence from the Los Angeles crime scenes matched the pan crime scene, San Francisco's then mayor, Diane Feinstein, divulged the information in a televised press conference. This leak infuriated the detectives in the case as they knew the killer would be following media coverage, which gave him an opportunity to destroy crucial forensic evidence. Ramirez, who had, de who had indeed been watching the press, dropped his size 11 and a half of via sneakers over the side of the Golden Gate Bridge that night. He remained in the area for a few more days before heading back to the Los Angeles area. Um, when it comes to this, I completely understand why the detectives were upset. There is a reason that when there's these well-known cases going on and it's very much in the media, whether it be just local media or national media, especially in the 21st century where everything's broadcast and it's very easy to have access to that information, you need to be careful about the information that you release because, like they said, they knew that the killer was watching and he would r destroy forensic evidence whether it's evidence that would eventually lead to his help lead to his capture that he would leave behind or if it's evidence that they would need once he was captured it's still putting the case at risk you know and especially when they're trying to find this person and this happens and so then they know it's he's in the area and if they give some sort in the press if they give some sort of indication that they know that he's there and they know something specific he he remained and then he head back to Los Angeles versus he might have stayed there and they might have had a better chance of catching him before anything else anything else happens you know what I mean um on August 24th 1985 Ramirez traveled 76 miles south of Los Angeles in a stolen orange Toyota to Mission Viejo that night he arrived at the home of James Romero Jr. who had just returned from a family vacation to Rosarito Beach in Mexico Romero's son, 13-year-old James Romero III, happened to be awake and heard Ramirez's footsteps outside the house. Thinking there was a prowler, James went to wake his parents and Ramirez fled the scene. James raced outside and noted the color, make, and style of the car as well as a partial license plate number. Romero contacted the police with this information, believing James had chased away a thief. So they obviously had no idea who it was, but I mean, after the fact, they figured out exactly who it was. So, I mean, shout out to him for being fucking aware of his surroundings and aware of the sounds outside because who know it, who knows what could have happened. He just thought it was a prowler, but little did he know there was literally a serial killer walking around outside the house. So I can only imagine like being like, it was what, <laughs> you know, like finding that out after, um, anyways, 
After this encounter, Ramirez broke into the house of Bill Carnes, 30, and his fiancée, Inez Erickson, 29, through a back door. Ramirez entered the sleeping couple's bedroom and awakened Carnes when he cocked his 25 caliber handgun. He shot Carnes three times in the head before turning his attention to Erickson. Ramirez told the terrified woman that he was the Night Stalker, this is where his name came from, and forced her to swear she loved Satan as he beat her with his fists and bound her with neckties from the closet. After stealing what he could find, Ramirez dragged Erickson to another room to rape her. He then demanded cash and more jewelry and made her swear on Satan there was no more. Before leaving the home, Ramirez told Erickson, tell them the Night Stalker was here. Erickson untied herself and went to a neighbor's house to get help for her severely injured fiancé. Surgeons removed two of the bullets from his head and he survived his injuries. Thank God. Like, this is another time where it's like one of those things like someone somewhere, whatever you believe in, was watching down on you because he was shot in the head not once. Not twice, but three fucking times and live to tell the tale. What? Like, how do you explain that? I, like, I can't. You can't. I, I just, what? But yeah, so that's where his name came from. He kind of, like, picked his name himself. And um, it was said because he didn't like the name they were giving him in the press. So he kind of wanted to, like, make it, like, a creepy name which, I mean, that's sick in itself. Like, you're like, I'm a serial killer and I want to pick my own name. Like, okay, psycho. Like, what? Um, Erickson gave a detailed description of the assailant to investigators and police obtained a cast of Ramirez's footprint from the Romero house. The stolen car was found on August 28th in Wilshire Center, Los Angeles, and police obtained a single fingerprint from the rearview mirror despite Ramirez's careful efforts to wipe the car clean of his prints. The print was positively positively identified as belonging to Ramirez, who was described as a 25-year-old drifter from Texas with a long rap sheet that included many arrests for traffic and illegal drug violations. So this is how they fucking found him. Um, but yeah, so before this happened, like what I was saying earlier, how he had a, like he didn't have a big criminal record. I meant in terms of like assault and stuff. He did have a long one, but it was for traffic and drug violations. Like, it wasn't anything along this line. It wasn't anything that they would look at him and be like, yep, like, can totally see it coming. Um, and obviously they had no evidence tying him to anything. But like I said before, the people before the, um... Romero household, how they saw the car that's the car that they found on August 28th. That's the car that they were talking about. So that's why they kind of had a hand in everything. Um, but yeah, so that's why it's just, it's just one of those ones that they didn't, it was like he slipped through their fingertips, you know, it was one of those instances. Um, law enforcement officials decided to release to the media a mugshot of Ramirez from a December 12th, 1984 arrest, which I will put his, the picture in there, um, for auto theft, and the Night Stalker finally had a face. At the police press conference, it was announced, we know who you are now, and soon everyone else will. There will be no place you can hide. So they're fucking, I mean, obviously the cops are like, thank God, now it's just someone needs to fucking see him, and that's it, we have him. So, this is his capture. This is what I'm talking about. This fucking crazy. On August 30th, 1985, Ramirez took a bus to Tucson, Arizona to visit his brother, unaware that he had become the lead story in virtually every major newspaper and television news program across California. After failing to meet his brother, he returned to Los Angeles early on the morning of August 31st. He walked past police officers who were staking out the bus terminal in hopes of catching the killer should he attempt to flee on an outbound bus and into a convenience store in East Los Angeles. After noticing a group of elderly Mexican women fearfully ident identifying him as El Matador, or The Killer, Ramirez saw his face on the front pages on the newspaper rack and fled the store in a panic. After running across the Santa Ana freeway, he attempted to carjack a woman but was chased away by bystanders who pursued him. After hopping over several fences and attempting two more carjackings, he was eventually 
subdued by a group of residents, one of whom had struck him over the head with a metal bar in the pursuit. The group held Ramirez down and relentlessly beat him until the police arrived and took him into custody. And I will insert a fucking picture on my Instagram showing what this guy looked like when he got arrested. They beat the shit out of him. And it was like 20 fucking people. Like, yes! That's how they should get taken down. I fucking love that. Good. Beat him. Like, good. These shouldn't be, oh, we, we took him to custody so nice. He literally killed how many people? No, beat him a little. Like, fucking ridiculous. Like, don't get me wrong. Police shouldn't. Police brutality? Nope. Not a thing. But this guy's trying to carjack people while they're fucking chasing him, trying to get him. And after he's killed this many people, I don't blame him, them for fucking taking a couple swings. The police, no. But the residents, I understand it. Like, they're trying to protect the people around him. Around them, you know? So, yeah. Ugh. Fucking crazy. From And then I saw some, like, news stories, and they were, like, chasing him down the fucking street. Like, a mob with pitchforks and shit. That's what I imagine. Like, what? <laughs> oh. Um... The jury selection for the trial began on July 22nd, 1988. At his first court appearance, Ramirez raised a hand with a pentagram drawn on it and yelled, Hail Satan. Um, it was a very, like, media-drawn case. And so there is a lot of pictures from the courtroom. And um, I believe there is a picture of this or just, like, Maybe not that exact day, but just, like, seeing what he looked like in court. And I'll put... There's just, there's a lot of pictures with that. Like, obviously, these newer cases, we have a lot of physical and, like, pictures of the people. And you can kind of see what this guy looked like and stuff. But, yeah. So, he was an interesting one. On August 3rd, 1988, the Los Angeles Times reported that some jail employees overheard Ramirez planning to shoot the prosecutor with a gun, which Ramirez intended to have smuggled into the courtroom. Consequ Consequently, a metal detector was installed outside and intensive searches were conducted on people entering. On August 14th, so then this, this is crazy. So on August 14th, the trial was interrupted because one of the jurors, jurors, Phyllis Singletary, did not arrive at the courtroom. Later that day, she was found shot to death in her apartment. The jury was terrified as they could not help wondering whether Ramirez had somehow directed this event from inside his prison cell and whether he could reach other jurors. However, it was ultimately determined that Ramirez was not responsible for Singletary's death as she was shot and killed by her boyfriend, who later committed suicide with the same weapon in a hotel. The alternate juror who replaced Singletary was too frightened to return to her home. So, I don't, what do you guys think? Do you think... Because, I mean, the boyfriend could have been working with Ramirez. We don't know. Do you think that maybe he had a hand in it? Part of me feels like he did. Part of me feels like he didn't. So, I don't know. I don't know if you want to make it look like he had no hand in it. I mean, he was going to get convicted no matter what. Like, they had a hell of fucking evidence. Like, they were going to throw the book at him. It, he showed no remorse for what he did so I mean if he did do that like why would you like you were gonna get convicted anyways like her dying didn't make it so that you wouldn't get convicted and they would just replace like she's like they're just gonna find another juror you know like it's not like oh well she's dead so now we can't find anyone else like no there's millions of people they can find someone else so I don't know so if he did do it I think that was a stupid idea but if he didn't do it Fuck her boyfriend. Fuck domestic violence. You're a piece of shit if you abuse the people you quote unquote love. That's not love. I hate when people say, hmm, I love her and that's why I hit her. No, you fucking don't. Or him. Because um, men can be abused as well. I love them. So that's why I do it. No, you fucking don't. You don't love fucking anyone but yourself because you wouldn't be doing it. That's why you're gaslighting them and abusing them and you're a piece of garbage. Don't mean to say I'm that. Um, on September 20th, 1989, Ramirez was convicted of all charges, 
13 counts of murder, 5 attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. During the penalty phase of the trial on November 7, 1989, he was sentenced to die in California's gas chamber. He stated to reporters after the death sentences, Big deal. Death always went with the territory. See you in Disneyland. The trial cost $1.8 million, $3.7 million in 2019, which at the time made it the most expensive in the history of California until surpassed by the O.J. Simpson murder case in 1994. Um, yeah, it was fucking expensive. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of shit. Like, like he was literally, like, on a fucking, I don't know, like, he was just doing any, like, it's a good thing they stopped him when he did. There's a good, it's a good thing they found him when he did, because I don't think he would have stopped. I think he would have kept going until they found him. And then they found him. Um, so now this is about him. So we're going to talk about his mental health, his appeals, his romantic relationships. Um, a little backstory. So me and my boyfriend went to California last summer. And I mean... Obviously, as you guys know, I'm very interested in true crime and the paranormal, so we visited the Museum of Death. If you've never seen the Museum of Death, I 100% recommend going. It was, I enjoyed it in a way, like, you can't enjoy it because there's a lot of death, but like it very, there's things that you see that they're not like very public, you know? Um, And there is a lot of information on him because he had a lot of fans in prison. Um, You'll see with serial killers and stuff, there is a lot of people that become fans of these people once the case comes out. So then they'll write them letters. I was in prison. Uh, I don't agree with this at all. You should not idolize serial killers. You should not idolize violent people who do this to, I think you, we can learn from these people as far as, um, how to stop them, how to help these people before it gets to that violent point and to make sure that they don't become like that. Because you'll also see in a lot of these cases, there, there's something that could have been done, um, before all of this happened. Like Richard Ramirez, if he was removed, because that was an abusive household, if he was removed at a young age, I feel like he would have been better off. And so you have to think about these things. Um, Ed Kemper, which we will discuss him at some point, um, he was a part of the reason why he was a very, very, very smart person. He was a killer, but he also, and it's shown in the show Mindhunter, I definitely recommend watching it if you haven't, he helped psychologists figure out testing in different ways to analyze um, people who were serial killers, had the mental capacity to become killers um because not everyone because there will be people who will have things that will make them seem like they could end up killing someone but they don't but there's ways to treat those things um mental health is not taken as seriously as it should be it's definitely come a long way but it's not taken as seriously as it should be when it and there's a lot of stigmas around it like you are not crazy if you have a mental health problem you are not like you have people around you I'm sure you have someone around you that cares about you that loves you that wants to see you happy and at your best you are not crazy you are not a burden on anyone and there's things that we can try and put into place and into policies to help people like this because just like the San Ysidro massacre that we talked about last week there is holes in the system that allows these people in a way to slip through the cracks and then we see these terrible tragedies not saying that that's an excuse to do that because there are millions of people that have these same mental health issues and they don't go around fucking killing people but you have to take everything that kind of 
made it into a perfect storm that then exploded, you know? Um, so I definitely recommend going to the Museum of Death. It kind of gives you a sort of, um, like understanding more of like what was going on at the time, what the pro, because there was also letters from him kind of shows you like his mindset and everything. And when you're reading something that they're literally like handwritten by him, like they're the physical letters they're in like a binder and shit and there's a bunch of other stuff I definitely recommend going because it also isn't just about killers and stuff like they even show you like when someone is embalmed like they show you the way that they do that and how that happens it it's interesting to learn about some of the things but it's also it's very sad it is a very sad place just seeing just because it is a lot of death but so yeah I definitely recommend if you don't have a high tolerance for seeing blood and stuff don't go because there is a lot of crime scene photos that are very graphic but if you can handle that stuff go and um see what there is I definitely recommend it um, so by the time of the trial, Ramirez had fans who were writing him letters and paying him visits. Beginning in 1985, Doreen Leoy wrote him nearly 75 letters during his incar incarceration. In 1988, Ramirez proposed to Leoy, and on October 3rd, 1996, they were married in California's San Quentin State Prison. For many years before Ramirez's death... Leoy stated that she would commit suicide when Ramirez was executed. However, Leoy eventually left Ramirez. By the time of his death, Ramirez was engaged to a 23-year-old female writer. By some estimates, he would have been in his early 70s before his execution was carried out due to California's lengthy appeals process. So now we're going to go into his appeals. So on August 7th, 19... Uh, 2006, Ramirez's first round of state appeals ended unsuccessfully when the California Supreme Court upheld his convictions and death sentence. On September 7, 2006, the California Supreme Court denied his request for rehearing, and Ramirez had appeals pending until the time of his death. What I don't understand is why he genuinely thought he was going to win an appeal. That's what I don't know. I mean, maybe he was appealing the death sentence? I mean, well, yeah, he was, but, like, why would they be like, oh, yeah, never mind. Like, what, what case do you have? I don't, that's what I don't understand. What, what do you, did you really think you were going to win? Like, you just kind of, like, wasted their time. Like, it was very clearly you, you killed a lot of people. You clearly have no remorse for your crimes, nor have you changed. So why would they be like, oh, yeah, you're right, never mind. <laughs> Forget that, like. No, they weren't going to fucking do that. What? Ugh. Um. And then going back to the romantic relationship, this just... Guys, have better idols, honestly. Like, these are not people you should be idolizing. These are not people you should be starting relationships with. Serial killers who show no remorse for what they've done to their victims. Nope. There are billions of people in the world. You can find someone better hundred percent these are not like this is what they want they want to be remembered they want to be idolized they want people to be their fans and follow after them and copycat them no don't don't do not no no I talk about, about them because I want to bring awareness to the holes that either allow them to slip by or the people that were killed those are the people that deserve to be remembered not him he does not deserve to be idolized. He hurt people. He killed people. He is not a good person. Ugh. I just, I don't understand it. Um, so. So. Um, Ramirez died of complications secondary to B-cell lymphoma at Marin General Hospital in Green Bay, California on June 7th, 2013. He had all... He also had been affected by chronic substance abuse and chronic hepatitis C viral infection. And at 53 years old, he had been on death row for more than 23 years. Which I've always wondered why, if they're sentenced to death, 
why they can just sit on death row. Like, if you're sentenced to death, why aren't they put to death? Like, he had been on death row for 23 years. I mean, is there, like, I would genu- I'm would i genuinely curious, why does it take so long? Why do these people, like, just sit on death row and never get put to death? Like, so, like, why, if you're not going to put them to death, why bother sentencing them to that? Like, just sentence them to life in prison if that's not going to be a thing. You know? If someone knows, please let me know, because I'm very, very curious. I've never understood that. I've never understood the point of putting someone to death, but then not putting them to death just to say they're on death row and then letting them sit on death row until they die. But they can just sit on life in prison. Like, I don't know. I don't understand it. Um, Psychiatrist Michael H. Stone described Ramirez as a made psychopath as opposed to a born psychopath. He says that Ramirez, um, Sazoy, S-C-H-I-Z-O-I-D don't know how to say it. personality disorder contributed to his indifference to the suffering of his victims and his untreatability so like i said like he, he was a fully confirms what i said he was made by his environment don't get me wrong there are people that they have shown are born like that but i don't think if someone would have stepped in and taken him out of that environment i don't think it would have happened i don't like he was he was around just death and negativity so he's he's not going to blink an eye to that he literally watched someone get murdered like it's normal to him you know like everyone has their version of normal and their version of society and part of it is made by the people they are surrounded with as they grow up because adults have a very strong influence on a child like you in a way create like you create that child to the point that they're born and then you also create them into their adult life because anything that happens to them while you're raising them or anything you do to them they are going to hold on to for the rest of their life that's how it is like that's how their children are very easily influenced because they're learning they're looking to you for guidance so if they just see that as normal they're gonna think that's normal they're not gonna have empathy they're not going to feel bad Oh, just let, if you're going to have a child, please raise them nice and sweet. Like they're little babies and they just, they love you and they look to you for guidance. And there are some cases where the parents are partly to blame for what you've done to them. And I think this is one of those case, cases, but there are also cases where it's, you had a f- great fucking life. There's no reason you should have inflicted this much pain. But in this case specifically, they had a hand in it and his cousin and his sister's husband. Like, he wasn't surrounded by A-class people by any means. Um, so if you guys are interested in seeing more of this, I have a list of different movies and stuff. So Manhunt Search for the Night Stalker is a TV movie by Bruce Bruce Seth Green, based on the true story of Richard Ramirez, and the two Los Angeles police detectives tried to track him down. Night Stalker is a 2002 film written and directed by Chris Fisher based on Richard Ramirez. Um, And then there's another Night Stalker uh, video from 2009 that's about him. And then The Night Stalker is a 2016 film directed by Megan Griffiths based on the life of Richard Ramirez. And then American Horror Story... Ramirez is featured in the fifth and ninth seasons of the horror anthology series, firstly being portrayed by Anthony Ruvivere, and then later by Zach Villa. So there's a bunch of different um, movies and stuff that you can find if you would like to kind of see more of what his life was like. Um and like see it because I know like a lot of people are like visual learners and not really just like hearing it so I definitely recommend I've seen all of those and they're very they are they're all very good and they're very well created um it kind of makes you kind of understand why he is the way he is or was because obviously he's dead now but 
I don't know. This guy was fucking crazy. Literally crazy. Like, this was, like I said, one of those cases where he was never going to stop. He wasn't going to stop until he got caught. Um, and it's, it's very upsetting. And I hope and pray that his victims are somewhere happy and wherever they are because he hurt a lot of people and he did not care and I think he got exactly what he deserved because he was a piece of shit garbage um so yeah so you guys let me know what you think about this case um did you guys think that he deserved what happened to him do you think he deserved to get beat by those people when he got captured do you think he didn't think that was excessive what's your opinion love talking to you guys once again, I appreciate you guys so, 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 so much for everything that you have guys done. We've only been released for less than a month and we are just getting bigger and bigger by the day. And I'm so grateful for this podcast and you guys. I love talking to you guys. I get emails, I get messages, I get a bunch of stuff and I love it. I really, really do. Um, we're not going to stop. We're going to keep going. Like I said, in a couple weeks, there's going to be a little Halloween special coming that I think you guys are going to like. And maybe a little giveaway. Wink, wink. We just had our first giveaway last week um, that went really well. So I'm super excited for that episode to come out. And yeah, so you guys let me know. Message me, follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, The CMP Podcast. So stay spooky and stay safe, guys, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.